Hi everyone, my name is Emma Gatman and I'm coming from New York City from the Kimberly and Eric Waldman Department of Dermatology at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And I'm really pleased today to talk to you about inflammatory skin diseases, the translational revolution. So it's important to remember that immune mediated inflammatory skin diseases affect many, many people worldwide. Approximately one out of 10 people will have some inflammatory condition, inflammatory skin condition, such as psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, vitiligo, and many others. In my talk today, I will focus on atopic dermatitis and alopecia areata. But we first need to remember where it all started. And it started with the developments in psoriasis. And this is how psoriasis patients looked, unfortunately, approximately 14, 15 years ago. And this is on the right, you see how they look today. Mostly they are clear due to so many advances in our knowledge in psoriasis. And psoriasis, I think, is the most successful case of molecular therapeutic targeting in any human immune-mediated disease beyond the skin. With a single drug, we now can control psoriasis extremely well in approximately 90%, up to 100% actually of patients. And we have now drugs that directly target key pathogenic cytokines that are also part of the genetic genomic risk of psoriasis. And a very good example is this study with recent Kizumab that targets IL-23, P19. And you see here really mind a blowing a PASI-75 results that are approaching 100%. And also PASI-90 results of 80% with recent Kizumab. So how did we get to this amazing point we now have in psoriasis? We started by increasing our knowledge through bench studies of pathogenesis that had biomarkers, both in skin and blood, that really helped formulate a hypothesis. And then we continued with a, a targeting, with clinical trials with targeting agents that also included biomarkers in skin and blood, the generated biomarkers of therapeutic response, and of course, we needed multiple cycles to generate success because as we know, for each success story, there are many failures. But also the failures are important because they really helped us frame pathogenic concepts and get a good therapeutic direction. And now psoriasis is known to all of us as a T17 and IL-23 center disease. So we now need to ask the question, can the success of psoriasis, this very successful psoriasis model, bedside to bench uh, model, be also applied to other immune mediated inflammatory skin diseases? And the answer is a definite yes, but definitely we need a road to pass. And such was the road of atopic dermatitis that we need to remember this is the most common inflammatory skin disease. It involves up to 7% of the adult population in the US, in Europe, 3 to 4%, and up to 25% of the children worldwide. Around the third of these patients, very similar to psoriasis, have moderate to severe disease. And until very recently, we had a huge unmet need for safer and more effective treatments in both adults and children in, in, with atopic dermatitis. Now, a, what happened in atopic dermatitis that really prevented the therapeutic development was this futile debate in the literature, whether it's an inside out or outside in disease. What does it mean? Inside out means that it's primarily immune uh, driven, uh, driven by uh, different cytokines that are important in atopic dermatitis, such as TH2 cytokines or type 2 cytokines, such as IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, and also IL-22 that is derived from the TH22 axis. And the outside-in hypothesis suggested that it all starts from the barrier that creates a barrier defect that allows penetration of allergens and microbes, creating the disease phenotype. But we would learn that actually these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and they can coincide together. So in 2012, we proposed a paradigm shift in the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, proposing that these a, hypotheses are not mutually exclusive and that already in the non-lesional skin of patients with atopic dermatitis, there is upregulation of multiple immune molecules such as type 2, type 22 molecules. This process is intensified even more in acute disease and much more in chronic disease. 
And of course, there are barrier abnormalities in atopic dermatitis, but some of them are generated actually through the action of cytokines. For example, IL-4 and IL-13 inhibit antimicrobial peptides. They inhibit barrier molecules such as filagrin, loricrin, and lipids. IL-31 starts the eat scratch-like unification cycle. IL-22 starts the onset of hyperplasia, also disrupts the barrier, and together with IL-17 synergizes to induce the S100. And this process is perpetuated in the chronic stage of atopic dermatitis. And you'll recognize many of these molecules as being successfully now targeted in clinical trials or already approved for atopic dermatitis. So how are we testing the contribution of the different immune axes to atopic dermatitis? Very similar to psoriasis through clinical trials with targeted treatments in atopic dermatitis patients. And, you know, nothing would have been uh, possible without uh, the very instrumental contribution of Dupiluma, both as the first treatment, a, a specific treatment for patients with atopic dermatitis, but also it contributed to dissecting the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. So Dupiluma is a fully human monoclonal antibody that targets IL-4 receptor alpha that potently inhibits both IL-4 and IL-13 cytokine signaling and the first study was a very short study, four-week study, with a total of 67 patients, 18 of them participating in the biopsy sub-study. And it was really helpful to understand the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. And, and that continued to a phase three study that we all know the results of the IGA-0 or 1 or clear or almost clear and EZ-75 that were the co-primary endpoint at week 16, both showing success and significance, both in the every week dosing and every other week dosing for patients with atopic dermatitis. And we have shown in our mechanistic studies in, of the dupilumab in clinical trials that dupilumab not only impacted the clinical response, but was also impacting both the inflammation and the barrier dysfunction of atopic dermatitis. And this was very instrumental because it was really the first study that established IL-4 and IL-13 as pathogenic cytokines in atopic dermatitis, cementing AD as being reversible and immune-driven exactly like psoriasis and really opening the door to all this amazing therapeutic development we now have, we are fortunate to have in atopic dermatitis. And just, I'm also a clinician and it's important to put a, what we know mechanistically with a clinical word. This is a patient of mine that was enrolled in phase three. You see very significant disease and this is how the patient looked after the treatment. So certainly made a huge difference in the life of this patient and many other patients worldwide. And as we know, the Pilomab is also approved in children, adolescents, and the approval is also now coming in uh, infants and small children. Now, let's talk about IL-13 inhibition. And I think it's important to ask, is IL-13 inhibition enough to control atopic dermatitis, or do we really need to inhibit both cytokines of the type 2 immune pathway, IL-4 and IL-13? So let's look closely into that, because I think we have our answer. So our answer comes from the study with Lebrikizumab that was a clean study, no topical steroids. And here, and I don't like to uh, compare studies that were not done at the same time, but we see, we can definitely say that the results are in the ballpark of the pilomab. Maybe slightly more, but again, it's not done at the same time, but definitely very similar. So I think we can conclude that IL-13 seems to be the most important um, cytokine of the type 2 pathway. Now, what about JAK inhibition? We need to remember that atopic dermatitis is this heterogeneous disease that not all patients have only type 2 immune activation, while that is common to all of them. Some of them have also Th1 immune activation, Th22, maybe even Th17 in Asian patients. So JAK inhibitors come very handy for these patients because they are targeting more than one cytokine pathway, including the type 2 pathway, but also other a, a cytokines and pathways such as IL-22 and interferon gamma. And I want to show you how we are improving upon the clinical responses with JAK1 targeting. And here I want to show you uh, using the example of Eupadicitini, but this is not the only JAK inhibitor uh, that is approved now for atopic dermatitis. So here we see 
a measure up one and two easy 75 and uh, the validated IGA clear or almost clear how it really pushes the bar of efficacy almost 80 percent responses with the higher dose in easy 75 and also more than a 60 percent in IGA 0 or 1 and we see even easy 90 responses who would have believed that we would talk about easy 90 responses and here we see that in measure up one both doses are inducing more than 50 percent easy 90 responses with upadicitinib now adverse events we know that jack inhibitors do come with some price we see acneiform rashes some mesopharyngitis a cpk increases but overall i have to say that Generally, it seems that JAK inhibitors have a better safety profile in atopic dermatitis compared to other diseases where patients may have other comorbidities such as RA and psoriasis, but certainly we need long studies to ascertain longer term safety. Now, the pipeline in atopic dermatitis is very busy. We have many successes now uh, from early studies like CCR4, um, um, OX40 antagonism with the KHK4083. Uh, nimolizumab shows a uh, success as well. Uh, and, you know, we'll see what time uh, uh, has for us. I think in five years, we will really revolutionize the uh, pipeline and the treatments for uh, patients with atopic dermatitis. And we also have some failures that we know did not work, like IL-33, TSLP, IL-17C, and IL-17A. They did not work in patients with atopic dermatitis. Now, I want to also talk about another disease that is very dear to my heart, alopecia areata. And I want to show you how are we extending the translational revolution to other inflammatory skin diseases from psoriasis to AD and now to alopecia areata. So alopecia areata has a approximately 2% lifetime prevalence in the United States, over 6.6 .6 million, almost 150 million worldwide, so very sizable population. Up to 10 to 15% of patients will progress to have total scalp involvement or total body hair involvement. And there is a huge unmet need for safe and effective treatments for patients with alopecia areata. Now we know from in, in small studies and recent clinical trials that JAK inhibitors are effective in alopecia areata. And there are several now in trials. And I want to show you some data from baricitinib, that is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, retalcitinib, JAK3 tick, and reposcitinib, tick2, JAK1 from Pfizer. Baricitinib is from Eli Lilly. And I cannot pronounce it, but uroxolitinib, a JAK1, JAK2, and this is from CONCERT. So different studies that uh, have different uh, times of endpoint as well. Pay attention that baricitinib has the primary endpoint at week 36. So you cannot compare to what we see for week 24. And then you see a, a, for retalcitinib and a brepocitinib and the duroxolitinib, the, the primary endpoint is at week 24. But when you look at the mean SALT score of these studies, you see very similar population, highly severe patients um, uh, with alopecia areata. Also pay attention that the primary endpoint with the baricitinib study was SALT score less than 20, equal or less than 20 at week 36, whereas the others are looking at mean change from base, baseline SALT score or SALT 50 response at week 24. And these are the results for the primary endpoint and also other endpoints. And we see here that the SALT score is equal or less than 20 with a baricitinib was significant for the higher dose and also for the second dose at 36 weeks. However, if you looked at the graphs, there was no significance at week 24. So they certainly needed that 36 week time. And the SALT responses at week 24, we see nice data for SALT 50, 75, and 90. With both the studies done by Pfizer and by CONCERT, we do see similar to other JAK inhibitor studies in other indications, acne, herpes simplex infections, and the CPK elevation. So we need to understand what is the best time point. It depends on the efficacy, probably for some drugs, 24 weeks, for some drugs, 36 weeks. 
And these are the uh, results of the babesitinib study. As I told you, at week 24, there is no significance, but there is significance at um, week 36. The safety looks good so far. There is some acne form uh, rashes, nasopharyngitis, some uh, nausea, and some upper respiratory infections, and some uh, herpetic um, um, signal. Um, but we'll need to see. And also remember, this is four milligram baricitinib, not the two milligram dose that was studied in the United States for uh, atopic dermatitis. In Europe, four milligram dose is approved for atopic dermatitis. Now, uh, this is the uh, study with the brepocitinib and ritalcitinib. Uh, and this is post hoc analysis showing a salt uh, equal or less than 10. Uh, remember, that's uh, not equal or less than 20. Uh, and we see very nice data with significance already achieved quite early for this, um, much before the 24 weeks, and it's creeping up with both drugs. And here, uh, Pfizer took two drugs as compared to placebo. In terms of safety of this study done by Pfizer, um, uh, you see acne, some headache, although uh, not much not, not more than placebo. Uh, overall, you see quite a good uh, safety profile for the study for 24 weeks. And my lab did the mechanistic studies for this, and we showed that when you are targeting patients with alopecia areata in scalp, uh, when you look at their scalp lesions at different pathways that we know that are important in alopecia areata, you see modulation of these pathways. You see increases in hair keratin genes, you see decreases in Th1-related genes, you see decreases in Th2-related genes, and also decreases in IL-12-23-related genes. And these are important because my group showed that while Th1 is important in alopecia areata, as you see here by increases in interferon gamma and related markers that are also important in other inflammatory skin diseases, such as atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, also the Th2 axis is also elevated, as you see here, by increased IL-13. And also we see increases in IL-13. 12A23P19 uh, and IL-1223P40 uh, across the diseases. And by the way, the IL-13 is only increased in AA and AD. Now, that brings me to a very important point that starts becoming quite evident by multiple publications now that alopecia areata is highly associated with atopy. The highest association is with eczema or atopic dermatitis, but also there are associations with other atopic conditions such as allergic rhinitis and asthma. And genetic studies also associated IL-13 and IL-4 with alopecia areata. And that brought us to do a study with dupilumab in patients with alopecia areata. The paper is already published in allergy. And this was a hypothesis-driven clinical trial in which we wanted to test the a contribution of type 2 axis in alopecia areata. And we showed that it worked primarily in the patients with high IgE and with atopy, either personal or familial. And um, we expect to see more mechanistic studies uh, from that study. Uh, and just you know, as I said, I'm also a clinician, very important for me to see what different uh, drugs are doing to patients. This is a patient with alopecia universalis for two, three years. And this is how the patient looked after the dupilumab trial. And he tried everything. He even tried cyclosporin that did not grow his hair. So that was certain that dupilumab helped him. And many other patients look like that as well. Just to show you that vitiligo also has now emerging new treatments going into vitiligo. I think it will follow the other diseases. Uh, so very exciting times, I think, in inflammatory skin diseases. And I think, generally speaking, in the last decade, there is a real revolution in inflammatory skin diseases with highly a, a, a successful a, a new treatments going into them that also amplify the current understanding a, of these diseases. And as I explained, this revolution started with psoriasis and now extends to atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, vitiligo, and other inflammatory skin diseases. And I think the translational research done on uh, tissue samples, both in skin, scalp, and blood, really helped us increase our knowledge on disease pathogenesis, further promoting uh, the therapeutic development.
And with that, I'm uh, really thanking you for your time. And uh, I hope you join me in appreciating this very exciting times we now experiencing, are experiencing uh, for a new treatment paradigm for our patients with inflammatory skin diseases. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation to speak here.